Hello, Bible readers. Uh, we are in Genesis chapter 1. We're going through chapter 2, verse 4a. One of the reasons I, I wanted Bible readers to start our first deep dive with Genesis is because this is a book that gives us lots of practice at different ways of getting to the meaning of a text. Uh, chapter 1, into chapter 2, verse 4, the first creation story is a poetic narrative. That's the that's the kind of uh, reading that it is. Narrative simply means story, a story told through a poem. And it's important for us to know what the kind of writing is. You know, like a poem is like a, a song someone might sing. The form of what we're reading is really important. If we called it history, that would result in some different interpretations than knowing it's a poem. Just like reading a Beatles song lyric, it would be different to read it than to hear it, right? So like, she loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's different and may result in some different interpretations uh, than to experience it sung. The same can be said for reading a poetic narrative like Genesis when we think it might be more like reading a science book that'll have a different result of interpretation, right? So scholars believe that Genesis is a gathering of stories written from various traditions put into one book. And I'm telling you this because it helps us understand what kind of writing it is and what's it, what it's for, what it was for originally, and what it can still be for now. You'll probably hear me say something every now and then uh, as we go through Genesis, something like this text comes from the P or the J or the D uh, tradition. The P tradition is the priestly tradition thought to come from the 6th century BC. Now, why throw out a date? You know, what was going on in the 6th century BC for the people of God? They were in exile, remember? They were in the Babylonian exile. So if you were a Bible reader with me last year, you'd know that was a crucial period of time uh, that was crucial for the identity of Israel. Uh, still is. Lots of what we read in the Bible is connected to the exile, and Genesis 1 is a really important part of that list. So what is it trying to say? Brueggemann says, its large scope moves from God's basic confrontation with chaos to the serene and joyous rule of God over a universe able to be at rest. An exile-era text describing creation in terms of God bringing order from chaos. Do you think this sounded like good news to Israel at that time? as they wondered whether they had a future, like this would be a huge piece of good news, right? It's really important, really important, that we understand that this text is written with a specific community and particular circumstance in mind. The Babylonians are claiming that Israel's God has lost. Perhaps this God is fake news altogether. This creation text is written to address a real historical problem. It makes a theological claim that God is still and will always be God through anything, even exile. When we see that Genesis 1 is written to address that moment in the life of Israel, then we also see what this text is not. It is not an abstract statement about the origins of the universe. Brueggemann says, this text is not a scientific description, but a theological affirmation. It makes a faith statement. Believers have no stake in biblical literism, literalism, which he describes as interpreting a text as historically descriptive uh, of how creation happened. He's saying that believers come to this text to simply hear good news about God, not how exactly God did the creating. Looking for scientific answers in Genesis 1, he says, is like looking at a beautiful painting and reducing the experience of it to questions about technique. 
Israel is not interested in the method of how the world became God's world. They're concerned with God's intent. And that intent was to bring order from chaos graciously for as long as it takes. And that kind of intent didn't just affect creation originally, but still affects us now. It affected Israel in exile. It affects us in the midst of whatever challenges life brings us now, whatever chaos we know. He says, when the text is heard as theological good news, it then leaves open all scientific theories about the origin of the world. The Bible takes no stand on any of these. The faith of the church has no vested interest in any of the alternative scientific hypotheses. The text is none other than the voice of a good news proclaimer. That's it. It's not more or less than that. So uh, there's a lot more to say about chapter 1 into chapter 2, verse 4, um, but I'm going to leave that so that I can get into chapter 2, verse 4, B, through chapter 3, verse 24. That's what we'll get into tomorrow. Feel free to, from what I just said, because I know you've probably read chapter 1 already, um, but with what I just said, maybe journal some of, of what struck you with a star, a question mark, a heart. Reflect on the, the theological point that chapter 1 is simply a, a theological claim. All right, uh, I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us at all times and in all places.